Hi, everyone. Thanks, Jose, for inviting me. And thanks, everyone, for being here today. It's early in the morning. Uh, my name is Luca Foschini. I'm the co-founder and chief data scientist of Evidation Health. Um, Evidation is a company I started um, eight years ago now uh, in California. We have three offices in Santa Barbara, San Francisco, and San Mateo. We're around 170 employees and uh, raised collectively around $62 million for, for Series C. We work mostly with a uh, pharma company to uh, design and implement studies that have, um, in general, sensor data with them. So digital data that is a little different than the usual clinical data collected in, um, in the study that pharma company are used to run. My background is in computer science. I have a PhD in theoretical computer science. And before that, I was at Google, ask.com. I was in cybersecurity to CERN. I've done a bunch of things before moving into this exciting field. And uh, today, um, I'm excited to talk about the, the promise and the power of person-generated health data, PGHD. I have um, talked about that yesterday at the AI and health track as well. Uh, how many of you were there yesterday at that track? Okay. Oh, good half. All right. So you'll find the first five minutes of this presentation really boring and a repeat of what I said yesterday, but it kind of is needed to set the stage for what I'm going to say later. <clears throat> so PGHD, Person Generated Health Data, is um, by definition of the ONC, the uh, Office of National Coordination uh, of Health IT in the United States. It's all data generated by patients and their caregivers in tracking and monitor their health. Uh, it used to be patient-generated health data, still PGHD, but this data is so, um, it becomes so pervasive and so helpful to track health in general, even before people become patients, that now it's been, there's a push to rename it person-generated health data. What does it look like? Well, it looks like many things, and the more futuristic take to it, to it is this uh, infographic from Science Translational <laughs> Medicine of a couple of years ago, uh, smart sensor data, smart home, wearable, implantable, your car, your home. Um, but in, in contrast to that, in saying complement to that, we should not forget that one very important piece of PGHD is actually patient reported outcomes. It's the voice of the patient it is validated instrument that are able to probe, you know, the level of pain or uh, the symptoms of anxiety and depression, for instance. Uh, and uh, that is also PGHD. So PGHD is a lot of things. And it's so much things that even if you just zoom in into the data generated by commercial wearable devices, so you know you could have wearable, you could have implantables, you can have surveys, just zoom in on wearables and commercial, the one you find off the shelf. This is the uh, view of the market two years ago. So this is already stale. Um, th there's so much stuff you can even read it. So I'm going to zoom in that uh, and, and just pick a few of this uh, um, of these fields that could be measured and tracked, uh, including readiness, heart rate variability, um, uh, sports analytics, um, things that are related to measuring exposures such as uh, UV and uh, um, and pollution, and even pet tracking. And there's a lot more there. Um, this is not to say that all this data should be believed. A lot of this data is not valid. Some of the company in this graph are not even there anymore. But things are becoming more serious and you know for those of you who are wearing an apple watch uh, it is now um, has functioned at our medical device software as a medical device uh, for a regular heart rhythm, heart rhythm tracking and fall detection so and you can take an ecg and send a pdf to your doctor so that's this data is becoming more prominent and also more believed let's say in domain outside technology what this data can give us is a picture of what happens in between visits, visits to the doctor in clinical practice or visit to the PI of the CRC in clinical research. And this is one of the commonality between practice and, and research that can be really unified by this other great mass of data that we could collect in between visits uh, and that PGHD can, can offer us. But hey, uh, collecting big amounts of data that can be done multiple ways, and many of those are definitely not the right way, as we know from uh, many technology news that we read every day. Definitely it's not the right way when the final user is unknown, uh, that does not know why the data is collected, that the data is collected to begin with. And so, and this is gonna be, uh, this is gonna sound a commercial for the next 30 minutes. <laughs> three seconds um, of, um, of, um, of achievement, which is a platform we have built at Evidation. And now it is a 3.6 million 
virtual research cohort of uh, potential participants in research. Anyone can install this app and they can connect wearable devices and apps and get points for using those apps and they get opportunities to join research studies and um, such as you know, there's a study of migraine that, you know, Roche wants to run and uh, that could become an offer to uh, members in achievement to become part of the study. And of course, when you enter a study, then, you know, there's all the process of, you know, uh, informed consent and all the things that you, you have to do when you run a study that makes aware the participant of what data is being collected for what reason, which is really important. Um, we do uh, retrospective research on this data as well. And for every new use case, we go back and reconsent the same data, even if it's already collected. We really believe in um, transparency on data use. <laughs> Um, this is the last slide of the introduction. Um, this is just to give an idea of the variety of PGHD that you can see. Um, this is a um, is the first cut to an observational one-year cohort study run by Evidation and sponsored by Evidation that's called Discover Digital Signal and Chronic Pain. We're following a cohort of 10,000 people with self-reported chronic pain for a year and collecting a variety of data from them. But the thing that I really, I really like is that in the same panel you can show that you're able to collect, you know, more standard measures such as instrument that measure uh, anxiety and depression or, you know, demographics, as you see in the panel on the left, but also measures of satisfaction with the treatment. That's more like almost like a consumer kind of metric that you see on the top right. And you can combine that with activity as objectively measured by wearable devices as this person are wearing in the real world setting. And so the variety, the fact that you can link this to an individual level can really give you a holistic view of pain. So we're really excited to take a crack of this data set. We had the last session in a couple of weeks ago. So really this is just like, this is open and we're really open to collaboration as well for those of you that are interested. Okay, now switching gears uh, and branching out from the presentation that I gave yesterday. Yesterday I showed some application to public health and uh, influence and outcasting. Today <clears throat> I'm going to show some applications that are more akin to the life sciences. Specifically, um, this is work on developing measures of cognitive impairment in real world with consumer grade multimodal sensor stream. That's a mouthful there, so we're going to unpack it in, in a second. Um, this is work in collaboration with um, Eli Lilly and Apple Computers, and it was presented, preliminary results were presented at KDD, which is a computer science conference a few months, uh, a few months back. Um, a little bit of background on uh, cognitive impairment and dementia in general. Probably I don't need to make any introduction to this room. You know how, um, how the disease is prevalent and, and debilitating and um, um, attempts to create treatments for that have you know, failed uh, dramatically over the years. Um, it's uh, it's really expensive. Diagnosis uh, of an AD uh, condition is is really is really burdensome. It really comes down to sit down with a clinician and being you know talking to them. So there's high interrated variability uh, in and in, in the measure itself is time consuming and it really fails to detect the early onset of the symptoms. So the idea was like, well, can we build measures that are just based on? <clears throat> Using a relationship with technology that could be more sensitive of this onset and more sensitive to change um, over time. So, you know, that could allow A, finding patient earlier, and B, um, being able to track if a treatment is working more effectively. This came down to two objectives specifically. The first one is a feasibility objective. <clears throat> Can I even give consumer wearable devices? To this population. We're talking about people with mild cognitive impairment and uh, mild Alzheimer's disease. We'll describe the population in a second, but can, can they even use it? Can they even collect the data? And second, is the data any good? Is there any utility on the data? So the first objective is a feasibility objective. The second one is a utility objective. The cohort looks like this. It was 113 participants over the United States, 31 symptomatics uh, divided in 24 with MCI, my cognitive impairment. For those of you not familiar with the condition, that is when you kind of start feeling that there's something off with your memory, but you're still pretty functioning on all other aspects. And then there were seven with mild Alzheimer's disease dementia, which is the beginning of Alzheimer's disease. So it's not like, you know, the end stage agitation is like people are starting getting lost and they have been diagnosed. 
Um, and then there were uh, eight two health controls. The diagnosis of cognitive impairment and AD were uh, according to clinical dementia rating. So it's a score from one to four. I don't know how many of you are familiar with that way of scoring dementia. Show hands, CDR, not that many. One, two. <clears throat> Well, it boils down to you sit down with the clinicians, they ask you a bunch of questions on how you remember things and part of the conversation. And at the end, they give you a score from one, uh, from one to four, from 0 0.5 to four. <clears throat> the sensor that we're given to this population amounts to the follow um, an iPhone, iWatch um, with um, raw sensor data access and sensor that can be put under the bed uh, it's called a Bedit. It was recently acquired by Apple. And then an iPad with cognitive tasks that could be run once every two weeks. And the, the cohort was followed for 12 weeks. This disclaimer that I have for a computer science crowd, I don't think is needed here, but you know, the study was a proper study and it was IRB approved. Um, there are very many streams you can get out of this uh, of these devices, of the sensors here. So in order to prioritize the one that you actually should collect, we, we went in with some hypothesis of what domain we believe are affected by, or we know the literature um, knows that are affected by uh, cognitive impairment. What are the symptoms that are reflected by this domain and could be reflected in the data the sensor collect. So mapping domains to symptom was the first step, and then mapping symptoms to actually data streams that we can collect from devices. Again, there's a, a lot of things you can collect out of the phone when you have raw data access. So we focused on only a few of these things. However, even if it's just a few of the things, uh, it's still a huge variety of everything from volume to sampling frequency. You go from 100 hertz to uh, accelerometer gyros from the phone and the watch to um, uh, once a minute for processed data like your step counts that's computed by Apple uh, uh, Health to things that are uh, generated only when an event occurs, like messages being sent on a form call, um, to tests that are taken only once every two weeks. So very big variety of uh, frequency and sampling. <clears throat> In order to collect this data, we had to build this infrastructure and you know, make it secure and reliable. Um, it was 16 terabytes of data total that were collected over 12 weeks. And it's not trivial to do that in a way that you can then trust the data that ends up in the cloud streaming things out of you know phone and watch at the high frequency is um not recommended and uh but yeah we we made it so that was part of the feasibility checkbox we had to check and then one thing we 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 hoped we had learned we started from the beginning do it but we kind of get to only at the end as a last resort was find a way to look at the data literally look at it, visually inspect it. And um, so we align the channels uh, into this representation that we call behaviorgram, which is basically, um, you know, the time series of all these data streams that you have across all the sensors aligned to the same time index and impute it. Um, and in this way, you can, you can do <clears throat> visual inspection of data quality very easily. You can see if there are implausible data points, you can see if the missing data is distributed in a way you don't expect. You, you can see if people are not wearing the device. It could actually turn into a monitoring system for the study adherence as well, though we didn't use it that, that way. Um, this is like a, an expanded version of the behavior gram. There are way more many channels, but this is are the ones that we kind of focused on when we start looking at the data. And so you, you, you see things from uh, stuff computer from accelerometer, that means just like raw acceleration units, gate um, measures, stride, velocity, um, things that have to do with, you know, Excel and gyro at the top. And then there's use of apps and use of phone kind of channels. And, and then there's like sleep channels at the bottom. And uh, Behaviorgram, again, really good for inspecting data quality, which is, I would, you know, going back, I would say that was the most important thing of the study, but also very good for hypothesis generation for, you know, the future. Um, you can you can see so many things from from this data that's you know that, that that's scary. Like if it wasn't a study, that would be scary, right? Because there, there you see, you have a holistic view of this is a day of in the life of a participant. You see, you know when they had interrupted sleep, when they woke up, uh, when they opened which app while walking to work, if they're talking over the phone while walking. You can see a natural experiment of a dual tasking there. People walking and typing on the phone, which is a you know very discriminative task if you are doing research in neurology. Um, and so 
this, you know, this is just a day in the life of a participant. Um, so switch, switching gears a little bit, when you have behavior grams and you kind of check the feasibility box, okay, we can collect this data. It seems valid. Now, what can we do with that? Is it of any use? So to switch to the utility objective, there are many ways to talk about utility of data. One, the one that we chose is a very simple one, is can we, can we build a model that just by looking at the behavior gram can differentiate between the symptomatic cohort and the healthy controls. Even with that definition of utility, there are many ways of, for doing so, for you know, building the model and doing the machine learning approach. You can think of you know, deep learning directly from the behavior gram, which looks like an image, so deep learning should do well. Um, but we, we, we took an approach on which we could um, explain um, the results a little bit better and interpret the results a little bit better. So we computed statistical features over behavior gram, just like mean, averages, aggregate uh, of, of the channels. And, um, and then just train an XGBoost, like the simplest model out there, uh, the one that wins all the Kaggle competitions in ranking this three cohort, uh, has a control MCIs and mild AD. Um, we had to match the population, the positive and the negative by age, even if we thought we had matched them at enrollment time. Uh, the year differences between the two distribution was only 1.5. So we thought we did a pretty good job, but you know, 1.5 year for this kind of condition is actually, it, it, it's actually a lot, so the model will learn age. Um, but after we match for age, uh, and you see that demographic itself does not discriminate better than chance within error bars, um, then you know the the results like that is the the accuracy that you get. I'm sorry, the AUC that you get uh, moderate AUC by using all the features of the behavior gram that we had computed. We also did a smoke check and checked the ability to differentiate between healthy control and mild AD that are the most severe part of the symptomatics. So you should expect much bigger discrimination there. And in fact, we do see that. We see almost you know, 0.9 AUC there, but you know, results are not to be trusted, of course, because the population is so small. Um, but it's a, it's a good, let's say, additional evidence that the model is learning something. Um, of course, since we compromised a little bit of accuracy uh, going for not the most bleeding edge machine learning techniques, at least we got back some interpretability from that choice. And uh, if you if you look at the SHAP, which is one way of plotting feature importance of the XGBoost, uh, what are the features that are um, that are the most important in differentiating between the two cohort. The things that you see popping up at the top are the thing that you would expect from the literature, but they are also all the things that you are confirmed you can collect with high quality and can sh actually show up in the model. So typing speed is at the top. Typing speed without pauses tends to be really differentiating between the two. Just below that, you see measures that are loosely related to circadian shifts. Um, in fact, we have a follow-up work in which we, we, we do a little better of a job at naming the feature and showing the circadian shift uh, relationship. And then you, you see measures related to use of helper apps and time it takes to set the timers and in general um, use of, um, of messages, messages sent and received. Now, this is in, in no way I'm going to say that this is something that you should think of as even remotely as a diagnostic tool. This is, you know, developed in a cross-sectional cohort. So it's comparing people and saying that people cognitions depends on how fast they type across people just doesn't make sense, right? There are so many other confounders that can, you know, just you learn the, your, to use your phone today. And I learned 10 years ago. I mean, of course, I'm going to be faster to typer. But we do believe that in a longitudinal setting within subject, if you do see changes in these metrics and you can collect this metric at the, at the high level, uh, at the high quality, because we've shown that in the study, then that could be a promising direction to go to develop this measure that track changes over time. How much time do we have? Um, okay, I have, yeah, two more slides. So to conclude, uh, we address the engineering and analytics challenges in um, building, uh, trying to build measures uh, of uh, cognitive impairment using commercial wearable devices in real life settings. And um, we show that the data can actually be collected and it does have some reflection of the symptoms that you would expect and they are um, agreeing with the literature. Of course, additional research and validation is needed to um, 
to to vet the, the validity of what we're talking about, especially in the context of longitudinal study. So this is really just like the first step of signal discovery in my mind. And particular attention needs to be put on privacy. This is a study. So, you know, everything the data use is clear, but if ever it evolves into a product, then there are, you know, a lot of questions there that needs to be answered upfront and how, how do we do that in a way that protects the patient privacy. Yeah, and again, large scale longitudinal is where we want to go next. Um, once again, uh, shout out to the behaviorgram. It was it's a very simple idea. It's not rocket science, but it really it really enabled us to you know trust the data quality and move forward in our machine learning pipeline. So you know I hope to see it more often visualized uh, for ev everyone that's doing research in multivariate time series. And finally, yeah, once again we're open to collaboration. Please reach out to me if you want to work on this kind of data. That's it. Thank you.